name is Rico Figliolini, and this is live with Prime Lunchtime with Brian Johnson, the city manager of Peace Street Corners. And uh, we are streaming on Facebook. We are audio podcasting, and there's a stream validation in progress for YouTube video. So hopefully we'll be live on there shortly. If not, we're recording uh, right now, and they'll be posted on YouTube on our uh, channel for Peace Street Corners Live. So. Starting right off, thank you again for joining us. And Brian, you've been busy. You've been, we've had the holidays, so it's been a little time uh, between uh, shows. But you've been off to Barcelona, a man on globe trotting and learning more about smart cities and and options that the city of Peace Corners might be able to learn. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about about why that? was I there? Yeah. Well, a, a couple of months ago, we were contacted. By, well, actually, let me back up. It was probably six, eight months ago. I was asked to speak to be a panelist at a discussion down in um, Atlanta Tech Village for mm -hmm. the Wireless Technology Forum. And when I was there, the moderator of that panel was a member of the uh, Metro Atlanta Chamber. Uh -huh. And when at the end of our conversation, they knew a little bit more about our intelligent mobility transportation laboratory that we've got. Um, we'll start constructing at the beginning of 2019. Right. And so in the incubator that we're currently in, and so a couple of members of the Metro Atlanta Chamber came up here. Right. And by the way, we're at Prototype Prime, the incubator here at Peace Free Corner. So That's thanks. Correct. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to them for lending us their podcast studio. So, you know, they had not known some of the stuff that we had going on here. So we invited, a you know, a group up from Metro Atlanta Chamber. They toured this facility. Saw more plans about the uh, the you know the mo the transportation laboratory we'll have out here with, for for advanced vehicle research right. and demonstration and everything and so they were impressed enough that we were invited to the big kids table and Metro Atlanta Chamber invited the city to join their delegation to the Smart City World that's um, un Expo. That's unbelievable. With all the cities they could have invited, right? That's correct. Um, yeah. The um, you know, so we got to join you know two other cities that you generally think of as being at the you know leading edge of technology here in Metro Atlanta. It'd be the city of Atlanta and, and Alpharetta right. are usually the two that yeah. people think of, mm -hmm. and we were invited to that that table. So we joined the delegation for Metro Atlanta, which then joined up with the U.S. delegation that, you know, comes from other parts of the country. And so... How big was that delegation? Uh, it was big. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, I don't know, probably all told there's, I don't know, 50, 70 wow. people, you know, yeah. from different, but, you know, you had some other cities that are doing some pretty cool stuff, San Diego and... Um, let's see, Seattle and, you know, Colorado and, you know, you had some, you know, but anyway, so we went out there and that's, you know, the annual Smart City World Expo is in Barcelona. And so yeah. we, uh, we joined that delegation and did two things. One, you know, we were able to tell people what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And two, that we also learned some things about mm -hmm. what others are doing or what, what industry we might end up looking to potentially have a partnership with out here and okay. share, you know, research, data, uh, you know, users, whatever. So we got, you know, we got a, got a little, a lot of good contacts, got a lot of good ideas, and we're implementing those because, again, we're, uh, we're going to probably be, you know, turning dirt in, uh, in beginning of February of next year. Wow. It's amazing to be able to have the opportunity to actually speak to other people, the big cities that are doing other things. I mean, to learn from them maybe a little bit too. Was it? Were they like willing to share some of that stuff? Was it? Um yeah, so, the, you know, the way it worked is you really had two distinct segments at the World Expo. You would have organizations, mostly government, whether it's city, state, or federal governments uh -huh. were involved. And they were there oftentimes to show off what they're doing right. in order to attract the private sector huh. to what they had, to okay. their the, 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 that you know asset that they were out there to tout. 
And then you had the private sector, the technology private sector, mm-hmm. that was out there looking for governmental partners sure. for them to, you know, create some sort of relationship with so that their technology could most of the time be used, be deployed, mm-hmm. you know, because they're in it to make money. Now, sure. we were unique out there in one regard, and that is oftentimes when we talk about this, we got this mile and a half section that we're creating this this intelligent mobility environment for there to be research and testing. Now, mm-hmm. we've evolved even within the last, you know, less than a year that we yeah. decided to do this. I've mm-hmm. learned so much. But we oftentimes were using the word corridor for a while mm-hmm. when we would talk about this, this intelligent mobility corridor. And, and you and I have even talked about how that changed. We started with the autonomous vehicle, right. Right. which the use of this track could very well have level five fully autonomous driverless uh-huh. vehicles uh-huh. on it. But it's not only going to be on it. And so we had to so we change the way we talked about because it's, it's yes. mobility yeah, instead because of just it's autonomous. not even just cars, too, because right. we were talking about, well, you know, advanced vehicles. That's I mean, that's a term that's but then we've had some um, we, we are having some conversations with some drone companies that are mm. looking to maybe do some drone testing here. Really? Okay. But when we were out there, we noticed that, you know, when we would use terms like corridor, like a intelligent mobility or smart city corridor, people have a connotation of thinking it's this corridor in which when you get in it, there's all this fully functioning deployed technology okay. for you to use. Right. Now, the North Avenue Project corridor in the city of Atlanta uh-huh. is an example of that. There's a section in North Avenue where they're putting all this technology in the street uh-huh. lights and the traffic signals, and you can get an app, and your your phone is talking to the traffic signal mm-hmm. that's controlling the pedestrian crossing at a certain intersection. So everybody is t- – all technology is talking to each other. Cool. And that's, you know, oftentimes it's called V to X, which is vehicle to everything mm-hmm. communication. Mm-hmm. So a vehicle is communicating with a traffic signal, which is communicating with a street light, which is communicating with the pedestrian's phones right. that are which walking is, there, which, which are communicating we, with other right, cars. Right. And that's all great. But yeah. we got some – we were unique in that we would – when company, or when, when organizations or private sector companies, as I was talking to at the um, World Expo, would say, oh, that's great. What kind of stuff are you going to deploy I'm like, well, we're not deploying it in ours. Ours, and we've found that we needed to start using a term that has a connotation of testing, more like a laboratory. Okay. So ours is more like a, you know, it's a transportation or intelligent mobility laboratory. Uh And so I will have to remind people that we're putting in a lot of the infrastructure necessary for a company to come in and say we want to test out some you know technology that allows you know i don't know street lights to communicate with cars and the signal mm-hmm. up ahead so it could tell the signal when a car is coming down the road right. so that it could get the light green in preparation for the car to hit Excellent. something like that yeah. we'd say cool we'll have the infrastructure for them to put say their sensors in the light poles mm-hmm. that we're going to install here mm-hmm. or in the ground or in traffic signal okay. or whatever but we're not wanting fully functioning deployed technology assets to be here we want them to be testing here now, we fully expect stuff to be failing here all the time because it's a laboratory right and they would be like oh <laughs> i'm like i'm not interested in the technology you have at this smart city world expo because that's stuff that you're ready to deploy right i want to know what you've got back at your you know lab that you want to test in the real world you Did know, you, so you got good feedback on oh, that. Oh, that's when they were like, oh. Okay. And then they were like, that's interesting. I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, they'd be like, well, how much is it going to cost? I'm like, well, you know, right now we're really worried about activity. Uh-huh. This isn't a, you know, it's not a revenue generating resource. Right. What our benefit gets is the old adage of activity begets activity. Mm-hmm. The more activity we get and interest in this, sure. the more activity we're going to get in 
technology park right. or prototype prime or mm-hmm. companies that may be created out of here, mm-hmm. we may end up starting to have technology park space filled mm-hmm. with companies specifically wanting to be close to this. Right. And over time, we talked about this before, and, you know, my, my, my fantasy is we get such a an energy and, and symbiotic environment within intelligent mobility and, and smart city technology that the entire tech park ends up taking on a theme that you oftentimes see elsewhere. I know Research Triangle up in North Carolina has some office parks like this that are themed like biomedical parks. Right. And they're all biomedical in there, and they feed off of each mm-hmm. other. We could ultimately attract, have one that attract, has a theme here. Yeah, yes, they, they attract each other. That's correct. You want it the same way people think they need to go to Silicon Valley or to a shared accelerator or an incubator because you have other people that are going to bump elbows with you and you learn from that. Absolutely. You know? Or sure. you need each other. I mean, automotive industry is this way. You know, you'll get a, an assembly plant. And then you'll get all these tier one and tier two part suppliers that want to get right there because, and then the assembly, the the big you know, right. um, you know OEMs out there want that because mm-hmm. they're like, oh, our you know, the company that makes our doors is right here. We just we can get it the door right here to assemble it. So right. you just and that's where we're and so the more activity we get in Tech Park, the more people that want to live here, the more business license mm-hmm. revenue you get, sure. the more retail and and commercial you can support. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's exponential it's growth on, and that's our goal. That's why this is an economic development project mm-hmm. to begin with. And I can see the periphery of that also. So it's not just smart technology companies, but all the things that support it, like you said. I mean, restaurants, everything that supports that type of industry would be would be growing because of that. Yes. Right. So, and, and I can see something else, and maybe you've thought about this too, the same way that some mechanisms, mechanisms will be tested here. Like we talked a little bit about street signs and voice-activated street signs, that things will fail, yes, but then you may also be able to see things, wow, okay, this is really successful. This is working really well. Maybe we can take this product and actually expand it across all our streets in the city of Peace Street Corners. Absolutely, or, or the country, state, world, mm-hmm. whatever, but yeah. yes. I mean, so you made reference to, you know, it was interesting. So, you know, when, when you're out at the, the um, Smart City World Expo, they have, you know, the exhibition hall, you know, just, you know, massive facility with people, all these delegations build their, you know, yeah little mini, you know, showroom, so to speak. And so there was some really cool technology. We were talking before the Mm -hmm. show about they had some interactive street signs that were geared more towards the pedestrian, the wayfinding. But you go up to the street sign. And so you've got the you got the long, you know, horizontal, you know, thing that you normally see a a street name on. Mm -hmm. And it, it's digital, and it's voice activated. So you go up to it, and you could ask, "Hey, where is the nearest Starbucks?" And in a more urban environment, mm-hmm. where you know you can't really see or whatever, it would actually pivot on the 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 pole yeah. and point you in the as the crow flies direction, and then. And get Audio, you going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Verbally, then give you instructions of it's that way. That's kind of cool. You know, four hundred fifty yeah. feet. Take mm-hmm. this road. Make mm-hmm. a left or whatever. And it's all, it, yeah. you know, you're know, like wow. And so you could have some of that out here, and then mm-hmm. we could end up saying, great, they get it fully functioning, ready to deploy, and then we end up wanting to deploy it at the town center. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned before too is that that I find even more interesting is the ability for the mobility talking to everything and that my car you know it's like two o'clock at night and sometimes you're at a red light or even a flashing yellow that you have to slow down that you have to get to whereas you know there's no one coming on the other side and you still have to wait or you still have to slow down but the fact that the light knows that there's no one on the other side and you're coming up that it will automatically change for you and allow you to to move on that's a good point. Now, so currently, there you know, most traffic signals are they are integrated into a motion um, sensor for traffic coming up to the uh-huh. light. So, like you said, although sometimes that technology fails, and right. there's two ways that it that has been done. The old way is you put a coil in the pavement. 
at the last parking st- or the last you know stall the the mm-hmm. closest to the stop bar at an intersection. Uh-huh. So when a car is on that wait pad, mm-hmm. it tells the traffic signal there's a car waiting to cross. So it starts its process of changing. Hmm. Okay. It's gone away from that because those fail a lot more. Now it's gone to where it's a laser beam on the signal itself, okay. shining down to a, a spot or two or three. Uh-huh. And if the laser beam is broken, you know a car is there. Uh-huh. Now, that can happen, and of course, it s- starts the cycle. Right. When you have the V to X technology, mm-hmm. if my phone is talking head it can tell through, say, the street lights mm-hmm. prior to getting to the signal. Right. It can tell the signalized intersection up ahead, which can also know the other direction if there's cars coming. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, Rico's coming down the road and he'll be there in 30 seconds at his current rate of speed mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he's going to want to go through. And so then the traffic signal can start its its cycle to change before of, you get to that God, final spot. Okay. So it could be green when you get there. Excellent. Look at or that. the other thing is, is you know, it'll tell you how long mm-hmm. when you get to the signal. Mm-hmm. It will tell you the signal will change to green in 19 seconds, 18 seconds. Instead of instead actually of, seeing the, the red light on the walk sign. Right, or, or having to, like, yeah, try to infer, okay, now it's finally yeah, saying the yeah. no walk sign's flashing. Right, it'll right. be soon, but I don't know. It'll tell you exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it's just even better. You know, I can, and I can see even better use of it for EMS, for fire, and police. Oh, yeah. Because then Well, they're it preempted. Will the they quarrel. can preempt it. That's exactly right. They yeah. can preempt it. And so yeah. that technology exists. Now, um, now, but it's it, not been used. It's not, and here's the biggest dilemma for full scale deployment of it. Um, with the exception of emergency vehicles, which can have it in their vehicles, uh-huh. um, you can actually attach it retro, you know, fit the the vehicle. Only the new cars now are being outfitted with. Oftentimes, it's DSRC, dedicated mm. short-range communication. Okay. And so it'll be a, a device built in the car that's constantly emanating certain information about the vehicle. So that's only the new cars have it. So that's one. So for you to communicate with any other automobile that doesn't really requires the automobile not to have it. It's for you. you got to okay. download the app. The North Avenue right. corridor in Atlanta is that way. If you want to interact with the traffic signals Mm -hmm. and know when it's going to turn green and everything. You've got to download the app and then it's got to be interfacing with the signals. So it needs to be on the app. Correct. Yes. You need to have downloaded the app and you're using it and then you would know. Mm -hmm. So right now we're in that period of time where it does require people to kind of do some proactive things to get integrated Mm -hmm. into this Internet of Things, because mm-hmm. IoT is how you talk, is everything do, do. talking to everybody else. But we'll get there to where you won't have to do it because your phones will automatically be doing That's it not or just whatever. That. I think I'm a great fan of Elon Musk. Everyone that knows me knows that. And, and Tesla updates their software all the time. Right. So I can see them just updating their car to say, the city has implemented this. Yes. Let's update the car. And now you're already in it. You now, of course, you know, the, 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 the detractors of that are like, well, I don't want the man. And to know where I'm at and all the time. And, you know, so I don't want it to happen automatically. I want to have to, you know, check a box Listen, to give them permission. I'd rather see the Jetsons here sooner than later to be able to, like, well, get you know, there, you know? My per- personally, when that argument comes up, I've always been like, you know, I don't, you know, doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, well, you know, not really because two reasons. One, the numbers game is such that the chances of, you know, them wanting to see what I'm there. So, you know, even if they're like, we're going to spy on somebody, there's so many numbers. And the other thing is, is if you're not doing anything that, you know, is illegal, unethical, or, you know, unsafe or something, what does it matter? I, you know what? I mean, I'm it, not exciting enough for it, for somebody to care what I'm doing or know where I'm at, you yeah, know? I've, I've told my kids that, and every once in a while I get, well, Dad, just wait for the revolution. <laughs> They'll be coming out the yeah, door. Yeah. And those are ones you're like, well, I'm not going to change you, so, okay. You That's know. funny, but, you know, you could always check out and go to the Northern Mountains and get a lodge for right. the weekend. You have your buried cache like... of weapons and all. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yeah, prep 
got bears. Yeah, but there, there's, uh, there's lots of things going on. Then, so the city is uh, moving further along. We're going to break ground. That's great. Can't wait for more updates on that. So now let's go to the pedestrian stuff that we always cover. Uh, Roundabout has been talked about on next door. The last two or three weeks, that's the app, the neighborhood app that people uh, know about. And, uh, you know, there's always the people that are saying, no, we don't want the roundabout. It's going to take forever. It's six weeks, six months or whatever. I saw the trees already cut down. You guys are moving ahead. And how long will it actually take for that to be complete? Fully complete? Yeah. I mean, I mean now... now a year, maybe just really? inside of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, and the reason it takes a little bit longer is we can't we can't shut the road down. Yeah, yeah, true. So it does, you know, extend the length of it because you are working around existing traffic. So right. that's really why it takes that long. Mm-hmm. But, you know, let's remember that intersection needed something. Yeah. We either had mm-hmm. put a roundabout in or we put a traffic signal. Yeah, I think it, the traffic... I mean, at this point, it needs something, a light It, it or did. So yeah. we had to do something. Those are the two options that the city had. And, you know, there are those who think it should have been a signal. And, uh, you know, I guess there's some arguments to that. Mm-hmm. But we like the aspect of a traffic circle, a roundabout, in that traffic's never supposed to completely stop. Now, the big assumption that people always throw out is people have got to understand how to drive on one for it to work. And I got it. It'll be a learning curve. But, you know, if you go to Europe, they're everywhere. It's second nature to them. So Mm -hmm. everybody can learn how to use it. And then when it it is used right, it is good because you're always moving. You never are sitting there. Well, the circle, if you're in that circle, you have to move and you just yield. That's you're, correct. As you drive up, you're the one yielding That's correct. to the traffic in the circle. That's, That's correct. The simplest rule, way simpler than a four-way stop sign, because people get to a four-way stop and still don't know who's right. who's the right of way on that. But the circle is so much easier. You don't enter it until you have space to do that. So, yeah, I agree with that. So, a year. So, that's not so bad. And and it still is functional, obviously, through that year. So, people will still be able to use that correct that, uh, traffic. Um, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, Prototype Prime and the coding school that's going to start January 28th, I think. It is um, into January. Yep. Anything new there? I mean, I know they're going to start. This is Georgia Tech's coding boot camp. Uh, 28 weeks or something along those lines, or 24 weeks. Um, so people are registering for it, I think. And uh, I mean, really, the the main news to mm-hmm. that is we have been pleasantly surprised at the interest in the coding boot camp. There's always that period of you know. There's always that initial, you know, I guess estimate on how much interest there'll be. Mm-hmm. But you never know until you actually go live and it's going to happen how many people actually pull the trigger. And, you know, there was the assumption that, look, coding is becoming such a big deal Mm -hmm. that a lot of people are interested in getting into it. You you know, these tech companies cannot fill or or companies that use coders at all cannot fill them fast enough. But in Metro Atlanta, if you can go to a coding boot camp, that's... um, that upon graduation, you have a Georgia Tech, you know, uh, mm-hmm. certification, which carries more cachet than, you know, sure. some other um, institutes that might be teaching it. Pro- and, institutes right. Both, yeah. uh, but if you do that and then you don't have to go into Midtown on yeah, the Georgia Tech's campus, our assumption was people in North Atlanta will be interested. But until you have people, because it's about 10 grand. And, you know, so it's not just like a couple hundred bucks. So it's a commitment. And we were worried that, but we've been very surprised. George Tech's very happy with the interest that they've gotten as far as people already putting their money down. Okay. And they're, they're helping with financial aid, I'm assuming, like most schools would. Well, there is a program. Now, actually, this one is one through, I want to say it's ARC. They have a program in which if an employer Uh sends an employee, ARC, it is a workforce development grant that ARC will um, 
will reimburse the company 80% of that, really? something like that. So, you know, if you were working for Acme Widget Company yeah. and you were like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm stamping widgets right now and this really isn't what I want to do long term. I want to yeah. become a coder. Mm-hmm. Within the company. Within the company. Acme yeah. Widget Company could yeah. send you to this coding boot camp. They could get reimbursed ultimately once you complete, once the, you complete the course. Uh-huh. So they haven't had to make as big of a financial commitment. But yet you now have a, a, a skill set yeah. that hopefully will allow you to go back into the company and work in a different you know position. Right. Um, and, you know, everybody in that company has got to... Uh, you know, a coder that yeah. they need. So, yeah, I mean, we've been we're pretty pleased. Um, you know, Georgia Tech's been a good partner with us. You know, they're a partner here with the tech incubator itself. Yep. You know, the, their tech incubator, ATDC, is a partner with us. So yep. they send mentors up here and um, other assets. We just had a company graduate from here and got accepted into their accelerated I heard that yeah. uh, I can't remember which one I should know it too I, I don't want to say I think but I, I don't want to be okay. wrong in case sure. but anyway we've had another success story of a company that didn't exist mm-hmm. the prototype prime was created this company was given the incubating assets necessary to be created uh-huh. they did well enough with the resource they had to then get accepted into a competitive program at tech for them to even have more and really be so it's yeah. kind of the life cycle you know of, yeah. a, of a business and we've been at the the creation side it's pretty pretty yeah. cool you know pretty cool you know at some point i was thinking you know this is like to name peace record is like startup city but it's really more of a smart city more tech uh, than startup, even though there's quite a few startups here, but there's way more technology going on too. Right. Um, the as far as so we've had that success here. Um, anything new? The, the city council meeting was just held uh, on the 27th. Um, there's been a few things going on. There was funding of new sidewalks, I think. Uh, Firebirds, uh, wood-fired grill got approved for their beverage license. Just that's part of uh, their new business in its uh, town center. And uh, there's a few businesses that just opened. Actually, I don't even know if some people even know that. Right, right. there. I want to say there are three now. Three first watch. I don't maybe? think they're quite no, yet. Okay. Now, you see them because they're the first corner, but no, I right. don't. Again, I don't want to say the wrong ones. Yeah. I think, but I want to say there are three. I think Firebird is hiring. I know they're hiring. Yes, actually. they are. But so, I think they're at January open date. Correct. They had really wanted to do December, yes. uh, but they couldn't I just quite. Heard that they pushed it out to January now. Yeah. But we had a. Uh, you want to call it. A, a, uh, if you want to say dedication or a ribbon cutting on the mm-hmm. fountain, yeah, uh, a couple weeks I ago. That. Yes, it was raining that day actually. I think or something, but it was. Um, in fact, that was. I was the week I was in Barcelona, and I understand it got like six inches of rain yes, in like the week. It was just yes, because I know the veterans' uh, monument work has started on the. Yes, on the site work, around, but yeah. they had wanted to do a ribbon cutting event too, and they had yeah. they canceled gonna, it. They postponed said, it until uh, January. They maybe, did something, um, but so town center's coming along. Uh-huh. We're we are still on track for a late March ribbon cutting on the town green. Oh, really? Right Good. now, no. You know, Mother yeah. Nature can have other plans, but yeah. we as it sits right this second uh-huh. are still on track for it to be now, done and, by then. And by March, I'm assuming most of the businesses will probably be open, maybe? All of them will be open with the exception of the ones who have not ne- did not necessarily start at the same time. So okay. Cinebistro will not be open, I don't think, quite yet. Okay. But, you know, that's a big operation, yeah, 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 and they started big, late. Okay. And then you've got the two out parcels mm-hmm. that are between – you know, Peachtree Parkway and the parking deck. Mm-hmm. And one has been announced. It's a lazy dog. Yes, I heard that. And okay. so they're just finishing up stabilizing the site there because it's right up against the uh, the stream. Yeah. So they had to build a retention, uh, you know, retaining yeah, yeah. wall and everything. And so they're, they're going to start soon. And then you've got the one corner... That's right at the corner of Town Center Boulevard and Peachtree mm-hmm. Parkway, and that one 
Um, Which one is? Well, the, the, there's a there's a letter of intent signed. I can't tell you the you know exactly who yet, but can you tell us what though? Like, it was a restaurant. Ah, okay, another restaurant. Uh-huh. Cool. Okay, better though. Uh, their own standalone building. Must be a big restaurant though. No, not necessarily. No, <laughs> well, that, that's actually they're they're wanting to have one small thing for somebody else, which oh, is what's okay. you know going on. So. Okay. That, that that should be announced soon, okay. you know. But Fuqua is the one they're mm-hmm. negotiating all those terms and everything. We've approved what we needed to for them to be able to then try to lock it in. All right, cool. Um, so and you know, I guess one last thing is you know you hear a lot of restaurant. I hear a lot of talk about you know man you know there's all the just it's just restaurants on on that side. It's not just, but it is mainly restaurants yeah, I mean, on the mostly, town center side. Two thirds, okay. And some of that is, a lot of that is by design because most of the space at the forum is retail. Mm-hmm. And we're not wanting to cannibalize retail on the forum side by putting it on the town center side. Mm-hmm. So it's more restaurant heavy on the town center side because our hope is that especially when you get the pedestrian connection. That's right. People will be able to go back. We can go back and each one has its general theme. One Uh more retail, one more restaurant. But we're not, again, cannibalizing the other's effort because we're considering this both halves as kind of together with the link as more of our downtown. And so, you know, we want both. So so what's going on then with the um, with the boutique hotel and the apartment complex that was approved because I don't see anything really moving well along yeah, right so uh, and people oftentimes forget this too so you know the, the the owner of that parcel went through and got it rezoned for mixed use to allow for the two things yeah. but these developers and this is going to apply to the Fiserv property too mm-hmm. they're going through this process to get rezoned for them to do what they want to do and it's really high profile for a while because they're going to have to get council to approve something that'll allow them to do, you know, a certain right. use, and right. the community is involved, and you get all this kind of stuff. But what people think is, is when that if it's approved, then it happens, and they're ready to go. Yeah, they're not. Obviously. They're not because you know they have concept plans, mm-hmm. and they've done some due diligence to know what levels of density and certain things, but they have not locked down financing. Mm-hmm. They've not locked down um, exactly who they're going to use, their partners, whether it's, you know, um, selling off parts of it to, you know, townhome developers or mm. what. Because, you know, master developers oftentimes are not actually doing every little thing. They just are the, you know, so this they're the t- puppet master. Right. And they've got all these entities. And so they're lining that stuff up now. They don't have construction documents done. Now they got to go in and get the engineers and the architects to actually create the construction document, the blueprints. Right, right. And that they don't takes have time. all. Right. It takes time, at least sure. a year. Okay. Years sometimes. I mean, really? Fiserv, it could be it could be, I mean, that could be two, two to three years, right? years before they break ground, and it could be another three to five before they finish the entire thing out yeah. in its entirety. Because it's, it, Well, and they, you know, I can understand that. There's 900 plus units. It's a mix of different buildings, different styles and stuff, so I can appreciate that. The property, though, at Town Center was the boutique hotel, Indigo mm-hmm. type, or Indigo, they kept saying. So, so that's who they had a, uh, a relationship with, right, the, I guess franchise rights to. Right. But uh, the condition is it has to be a boutique hotel. Right. It cannot be a... But they have to come back for approval because they kept saying Indigo. Indigo is one type of boutique. Right, but there are others. Correct. Right. But, you know, boutique and who's mine? Bohemian is mm-hmm. another chain of okay. boutique hotels. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean. So there's only two things, really, a boutique hotel and the apartment right. complex. Can't imagine him selling off part of that, but. I, does, I don't think, well, okay, he could sell off the rights to develop it. Remember, one of the conditions was the boutique hotel mm-hmm. has to be one phase right. earlier than the apartments. Right. Because that was built in to prevent somebody from coming in and building the apartments. Mm-hmm. 
which are the money making for them. But then the the thing that really got council excited is a boutique hotel right. at our right. town center. They would then say, "Oh, we don't have a user." So right. we said, "You've got to be one." Except you can't get a CO for mm-hmm. the apartments till you do for the oh, yeah. the hotel. You can't get you know your uh, building permit on the apartments till you get your building so permit on the hotel. So if, they, if they have a salt that they'd have to really coordinate the whole, that, right? Or, or sell the whole thing. Or sell the whole thing. Or if they sold it, the hotel will have to probably grow, build first, and that would solve the problem. That's, that's then true. Then they can come back later that's and build, build the apartments. Okay. Um, so there's still a lot going on. There's still things up in the air and stuff as far as that goes. Yeah. I mean, you know, all that process did was give the owner of the property the right to do something different than he had the right before. Right. But, you know. And you haven't heard anything new, really, with five serve property as far as I mean, they were approved, but they're just moving they're do, along. They're, yeah, they're doing well, their we, thing. we there's indications every now and then that mm-hmm. they're still moving behind the scenes. Okay. So you know, but again, until they need the next thing they would need from us is really a land disturbing right, permit. Because they haven't cut anything down, obviously. Right, they, and, and they so, can't do that until they're ready to stop moving. That's good. Well, we won't issue, you know, an LDP until we see the actual real site plan right. okay. and all that. And so that's what they're working on. Okay. But. Um, Holcomb Bridge Townhomes, that's the townhomes by town center. Right? No, no, no. That's not. I'm sorry. That's this is that's out. So what is that between Hulk, the intersection of Holcomb Bridge and Peachtree Corner Circle and Holcomb right. Bridge and Spalding? It's that okay. section in between there. Mm-hmm. It's a new. I think it's 17 units. It's yes. not big, but okay. that one is just trying to figure out whether the ingress egress point to that townhome development mm-hmm. has unlimited. Uh, has any constraints on their entrance, meaning can they make, because there's no signal, it's not an intersection, right. so are, are they going to be allowed to make a left out onto Holcomb Bridge Road in a very busy section, or is it okay. going to be a right in, right out only? Right. So. Which could, yeah, some people hate that, right? <laughs> well, I mean, who doesn't? But then also people really hate when, you know, you're driving down the road and people are forced to make a left-hand turn in front of you when you're doing a high right. rate of speed and yeah. you have accidents and yeah. people get hurt or die. And I mean, so. <laughs> Anything new going on on Hulkin Bridge, Jimmy Carter, besides that? Like, you know, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, any new, uh, where all the apartments are. But there was talk maybe about... Uh, New development at some point. There was hope that uh, maybe there'd be um, some areas there that might be redeveloped. Anything new? Well, there is, but there's some pretty creative things that we're 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 doing our due diligence on behind the scenes on some redevelopment stuff. Okay, that it just it's not definitive enough for me to be able to talk about it yet. Mm -hmm. But yes, there is some definite need to do some redevelopment in some areas and council has been very clear to me that they want me to leave no stone unturned on some creative ways to maybe redevelop some of those areas and so we have some we have some pretty unique stuff that might ultimately uh, work out but you know you never know and these things are kind of especially when you're a a government that's going to be involved in some capacity in real estate and in, 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 in improving mm. because when you've got property acquisition and you know infrastructure improvements it can it can get complicated if people know that the city's looking at something sure. or you know you get people who will hold out on selling because they think oh i can make you know yes correct and you know so you just you just got to be careful on some of that because you know which is why you have some of these economic development organizations that can do things quietly right. and are not so um we we got some we got a couple of pretty progressive thing you know methods for us to maybe do some things there oh. so hopefully Sounds can announce exciting. something soon Excellent. Yeah, I can appreciate the. Uh, I think it was uh, at some point when Gwinnett, Gwinnett's school board was um, questioned about uh, purchasing property and stuff for uh, schools. 
Uh, people were a little upset that it was like closed door discussions, but really, I mean, the issue is people will jack up their prices. The expectation is government's coming in. I want to, I want to get as much money as I can for that piece of land, and uh, so there's a reason for quiet negotiation. Right now, you know, of course, the key there is it's only the negotiation. Once decisions have to be mm-hmm. made officially mm-hmm. or binding commitments are made, it has to be done in a in a public forum. open Correct. public forum. But at so. least by that point, you have a letter of intent. Maybe Correct. if everything goes through, this is what we're going to do. So there is yes, there is an approval process. It that can be abused. People, it is abused. Yes. And so yes, it's not. Some yeah, there, there, it can yes, be. it can be. I yeah. mean, so it, it, it it's got to be carefully monitored, but mm-hmm. it it is a necessary. Um, um, we have Simpson Wood uh, Park. Anything? Uh, I was just there at the chapel. I think when at two hundred, well, when at two hundred was doing a um, a vault. They called it a story vault, like mm-hmm. NPR yep. does. My wife and I were part of that, along with I don't know, dozens of other people. So we were interviewed about. Gwinnett County. We came here in 95 and about how, you know, it's changed over the last 20 odd years or so. And it's changed quite a bit (laughs) since we moved here in 95. I mean, the forum wasn't there. I mean, there was lots of things that weren't around. Right. Um, But um, so anything new with the park? I mean, well, it, there's no, a you plan know, plan or something. Well, that, uh, at some point, not yet. Okay. So there's a you know a couple of things about parks. I will lead though by saying it's always, you know, it, it's always interesting to note that you know for those who don't think that the city of Peachtree Corner should have been created, you know, Simpsonwood is an example of if Peachtree Corners hadn't been created, that would not be a park. No, Mm-mm. it would be another subdivision of homes. Probably with 200 you know, homes, I think is the way it looked like. And, you know, same with, like, town center. It would just be garden-style apartments. I mean, it would not be anything unique if the city had not been, you know, created. But as far as Simpson would, so interesting, it has not been officially master-planned yet. Right. And I know um, our current county commissioner, Lynette Howard, was, you know, very instrumental in helping uh, acquire that so it Mm -hmm. didn't get developed. And I know was wanting was getting the county commission closer to actually going through that. But, you know, she, of course, um, now will no longer be in office in January. So I don't know what the new how the new commissioner representing this area feels about it. We still want it to be master, you know, plan. We do know that the whatever the master plan looks like, it is supposed to be a passive park. So they're not going to activate it like putting – the plan is not to put like ball fields or mm-hmm. big athletic complex. It's going to be a passive one okay. where there would be facilities, but they would be, you know, passive facilities, of, you know, p- covered pavilions for right. picnics right. or, you know, playground mm-hmm. or open grassy area to throw the Frisbee or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so that one is done. We'd like to see um, Jones Bridge Park – Master plan. Yeah, that's amazing to me that there was, I was on the Park Authority at one point for a few years, and that's amazing to me that that was never master planned. Actually, it is. My understanding is the current Gwinnett County Parks and Rec director told me it is the only remaining park in the county's inventory that has still not had a master yeah. plan. Yeah. And I know Commissioner Howard was amenable to that, and, mm-hmm. and so was the Parks and Rec director. And so I definitely think that that stands to be done. Good. Also, in in the sense of maybe there is a scenario in which you're going to have a pedestrian crossing over the Chattahoochee in that location because mm-hmm. you have a national wildlife refuge That's on right. the other side. That's right. So there is a natural or at least a less difficult linkage point between mm-hmm. the two. And clearly up until recently, there was at least half of a bridge that <laughs> did span that section also. So it's not yes. uncommon to have a span there. So. Right. I do think that there's some potential there. So, you know, you know, I, I, depending yeah. on what the county commission has on their plate, I think those are two that are important to us here yeah. for obvious reasons. I, I'd love to see that. I, it does, people may not understand, it does cost money actually to create a master plan. Even if the master plan is there just to say that it's a passive park or that these things are oh, absolutely. You know, what it is. And there is a goodwill Goodwill building? Not Goodwill. I forget what it's called now. There's a a building there that's um, being used as a facility for, um, I think it's part of the park. 
there is a there is a, a, a multi purpose building of some sort. There. Building yeah. of some sort. I don't know what it's, know what it's used for. They don't have any active I think, uh, uh, from, recreational programs no, in that. I don't think. No, but I think you can rent it out as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah I think so too. Point. I don't. I don't know about now. Um, but let's segue because you mentioned Lynette Howard, uh, county commissioner, represented this area for a few years, um, is no longer county commissioner for this part because Ben Koo... Well, well, is until January. Oh, correct, yeah. is until January. So the elections have <laughs> that blue wave that didn't go waving across the United States, quite frankly, well enough, I guess, for some Democrats, did take a blue wave across here, uh, across this area. So we had a change in three of our state, we have three state senators that represented a portion of Peachtree Corners and all three changed. Right. And uh, one of our state house, we have three state house members that changed mm-hmm. and the one Republican of the three Stay. Um, no. did on. not. Yep. Okay. And so That's right, those. we have four new representatives to the you know, Georgia General Assembly and a new county commissioner. Yeah. So how does so, that affect the city? <laughs> well, you know, a couple of ways. So one advantage of being a local government is partisan politics don't play a role at our level. Mm-hmm. You know, the old adage of, you know, potholes don't care about which party you're right. a member of. It is sure. so true. We are, you know, local government's often called the government of last resort. We are Pure service delivery. We don't have social programs. We don't have any of that uh, indirect services. Mm -hmm. Even counties have some indirect services, you know, like health department and jail, stuff that not everybody has to use. Sure. Mm -hmm. You have to have it, but not everybody. We are in the uh, cities are in direct services. I mean, roads, water, sewer, drainage, police, fire. Mm I mean, directly to um, res- so th- th- those don't care, you know, about your your. So that's great because we can when we talk to our representatives, we don't have to worry about that. So for us, mm-hmm. it's just about establishing the interpersonal relationship that you mm-hmm. need in the workplace, and you know, it's just getting to know them and communicating and we can help them in certain ways they can help us in certain Mm -hmm. ways and so we've already done it um the mayor has met with all of our new delegate um you know delegation already Mm -hmm. um a couple of other council members have also i know councilman eric christ has um he's he's you know got a relationship with with all of them but the mayor had met with all of them and at the, you know, like had coffee with them kind of thing and just said, you know, looking forward to working with you. Here's what we can do for you. And, you know, sort of. And then he offered at the end of that, he said, you know, hey, if you want to know a little bit more about the the, the gory details of local government in general or P- City of Peachtree Corners in, in particular, he extended me, you know, that would be and they all took him up on it. <laughs> so I was able to successfully get all of them in the same room at one time. And so this last Monday, they came into City Hall, and we had a, 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 a little working lunch there. And they mm-hmm. stayed for all but one stayed for about two and a half hours. I and mean, it was a great, you right. know, discussion about, you know, again, how local government works in general or, or in the state or here within the city mm-hmm. and what's important to, you know, what do city governments really, you know, care about as it relates to state government mm-hmm. and, you know, state law and all that kind of stuff. It was a great one. I think they learned some things. I know I did, but, you know, yeah. again, it was great because it was just developing a relationship with somebody who, you know, we had great relationships with the other ones, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, so they're great people. All of them, the incumbents and the new ones, all have, really, you know, truly servant hearts. They want to serve. They, they want to be yeah. a public servant. That yeah, was I, great. I, I, I get that. I think we had, I had interviewed um, three of them, actually, Ben Koo, Beth Moore, um, Harold. Sally Harrell, uh, all good people, all intelligent, all wanting good hearts that they wanted to get the stuff done. Mike, and you may not be able to answer this, but my curiosity is how essentially will the Democratic representatives from here work in a majority Republican House um, and have the ability to deliver for the city? Depends on who you're asking for. 
Okay. So, for instance, if the city of Peachtree Corners had a piece of legislation that mm-hmm. really just affected us, like we wanted to have the ability to, you know, do something, or we, we wanted to create a redevelopment authority or okay. something, you know, mm-hmm. that we need the General Assembly to give us permission, it's local legislation. So it doesn't have the same issues of party affiliation because it only affects us. Right. And so you really, even at the state level, you tend to get bipartisan support for something because it's a service delivery component. It's a quality of life thing. So in my, you know, many years of doing this have uh never run up against party affiliation that has pushed back against local legislation. So now, they really look at the delegation and what that delegation that's correct. from this So then we wants. really want, yes. And okay. so they're like, okay, you know, okay. Peachtree Corners has got three in each chamber. How do they feel about this? And so then we mm. work with them prior to to say, can we can, you know, will you support this? Or, you know, and they'll tell us right. yes, no, whatever. But mm-hmm. it's really not based on party affiliation. Well, that's good. good. Now there's that's stuff good. above that sometimes that can affect all cities. I mean, last session, the state, and oftentimes it's certain parties that push this, the state decided that cities should not be given the authority to decide which materials can be used for multi- family buildings of a certain height. There had mm-hmm. been a, restri- a requirement that if in a, a couple of cities, I know Sandy Springs was one that had it, mm-hmm. I think J- Johns Creek, but there was a requirement that if a multifamily structure was built that was going to be above, I believe, three stories high, mm-hmm. you had to use structural steel. Mm-hmm. As opposed to wood. As opposed to wood. Yeah. And the timber industry got upset, in, upset yeah. mm-hmm. and lobbied a particular party and then mm-hmm. the party leadership said you know what the state should be you know mm-hmm. cities shouldn't be given that right to do it we should keep it big one fight that's coming is a small cell technology oh really? big fight coming big fight last time so the telecommunications company's argument mm-hmm. is cities are all over the map on regulations regarding cell towers, uh-huh. the big ones, yeah. and even the small ones. And so now with tele- with communications getting so um, involved, there's a need for more towers, mm-hmm. but they don't need them to be the monstrosities that oftentimes you know we get, um, like at the town center. Which oh. for those who want, to, I would love to move that thing. Two million dollars. Two million dollars. Two million dollars is what we were quoted as it would cost to move it. And even then, you're not able to move it somewhere that you can't see it at all. I mean, no, but I know. Two but million. Geez. I mean, we just flushed two million dollars down. I, 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 where the would city you even move just, it to? Because correct. Like, uh, well, but even then, yeah. I mean, would you as a taxpaying resident here think that that was a good use of no, your not money? Two million dollars to move. So people else's. are like, why did you let them? There? They were there before us, and yeah. if we want to move it, besides, it's awful nice to know that my cell phone has a strong signal. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we all do. But anyway, yeah. you don't For need sure. those as much. You need smaller ones. Yeah. And so they're trying to deploy more often, but but cities have regulations because they're wanting to put it in our right-of-way. Mm-hmm. And there's regulations about where you can put it. Well, the telecommunications companies don't like it. They want because, to put it wherever they want to put it, right? Well, to a degree, yeah. but they also recognize that they can't put it anywhere. So their argument to the state is, look, Georgia, you need to regulate this and tell all the cities and counties in the state how what regulations they can have. Okay. You come up with it so it's standard. Now, that has some merit. I, I understand it has some merit to, okay, because right uh-huh. now you could literally two cities could be yeah. opposite in the spectrum. Abs- absolutely. So it does make it more difficult for them. But also, the, the and I was talking to the de- new delegates about this, you know, so you're going to have some difficult decisions because on one hand, that makes some logical sense. But on the other hand, how much local control are you willing to pull from mm-hmm. the local people who live in this community and give it to Atlanta? For instance, you know, we had recently a company that wanted to do it and they wanted to put one right by Simpson, right across East Jones Bridge from Simpson, in between Simpson and the backyards of the Linfield houses. Really? I didn't know about that. And we didn't like it and they uh-huh. wanted it there for various uh-huh. You know, atmospheric and topographical reasons, they needed something who's, right who's there. Whose land was that that they would in our right of way? It's our it's our oh, street. Okay, okay. 
and we didn't like that. And so that would be an example where if the state said, well, if they meet certain things, then you have to let them do it. Our local community may be like, we don't want it that close mm-hmm. to a school. Mm-hmm. Or it could be neighborhoods, or we don't want you know. So this is going to be a big fight. I oh, guess. it will. They got close to having it passed last year yeah, because the lobbyists can actually. Mm-hmm. What well, I mean, think about the big com- telecommunications companies and the lobbying right. that you, you get there, and even Georgia Power wants likes this because it's power that you got to run to all these. Yeah. I, I mean, so that those are the kind of things that, you know, you do run into some – There's it's a generalization, but right. sometimes a, a political persuasion does have a particular outlook on certain things. Yeah. Some like bigger government, some don't. So you do run into it in that context, but not at the local level. Okay. So Cool. Um, we're almost we're at the end of the yep. hour, Brian. This is always great to be able to do this. I want to thank uh, Carl Barham, my um, – New co-host in another podcast that we'll be doing. Carl's been uh, hanging out and ch- making sure the cameras are all working fine and getting things uh, going. So I want to uh, share with you all also that we will be having a new podcast show coming out. It's a business-oriented podcast show. Carl Barham is my co-host on that. It's called Capitalist Sage, and we'll be doing that twice a month. Inviting, it's a short podcast, 20 minutes, inviting special guests on to talk about really great gritty, uh, down down and dirty business stuff that you need to know as a business person and what real life business is about. So not that high level, but actionable stuff that you can go away from that 20-minute podcast and actually say, I can use one or two of those pieces of advice from that sage, if you will. So uh, look out for that at PeachTreeCornersLife.com and on our Facebook page because I'll be putting out that information as well. Uh, the Ed Hour is coming back, and we'll have a special guest in a couple of weeks. We're planning that out, Alan Kaplan and I, on that. And at some point, we are. Uh, at some point, I will actually be launching a new publication, and uh, that will be covering the city of Peace Street Corners. And I'll be putting out more information on that. Uh, but that'll be first quarter of the year, and uh, you get all that. So, Brian, I want to thank you again. Thanks for having me. Enjoy it. Yeah, thanks much. Thank you, guys. And join us next time. Facebook, YouTube, which is what we experimented on now. So go to our YouTube channel and like us there. So if you're not on Facebook, you can find that there. Thank you. Have a great day.